Yeah, so the, the idea of what are sort of, what are patients doing or what does the environment look like around them that actually will put them at risk for developing uh, IBD, the same would apply probably for other autoimmune diseases. Is there, again, that elusive environmental trigger? We don't know for sure, but this is what's been proposed. Anything that could sort of impact the integrity of the bowel wall, where maybe the bacteria sort of are able to sneak into the mucosa and create that inflammatory response that goes unchecked when you have a gene. So that sort of makes sense that let's think about things that could impact the permeability or the integrity of the bowel wall. Um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, for example, has been proposed as something that changes maybe the lining or the integrity or the mucus layer, um, which opens up the, the cells to be um, for bacteria to invade. So history of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories is something we always ask. Antibiotic exposure is probably one of the more exciting things that people are chasing because it will change the microbiome. And again, if you change your flora that you are um, born with and then sort of settle in within the first three years of life, that's the proposed time frame where you actually acquire your adult microbiome. Um, so children with earlier onset IBD, we are often focusing on in the first two years of life, did you get antibiotics that changed the flora? And the answer is yes. The studies have shown, the epidemiology studies have shown that children who have received multiple course of antibiotics um, are at risk of getting IBD. And in adults, it looks like antibiotic within the year preceding the diagnosis actually looks like it increases the rate of diagnosis. Now, the gene had to be there, so it's not like it's a random event. Any of us who took antibiotics, if we don't have the gene, I don't think that's gonna be the result. So you have to understand what are the susceptibility genes, and in those individuals, should you avoid antibiotics, Obviously, if they need antibiotics, they do, but not a random ear infection that is probably viral in pediatric patients in particular. Maybe limit the exposure to antibiotics would be helpful. And so anything that changes the microbiome, you could imagine, could affect um, the invasion of the microbiome in a genetically susceptible host. Diet, that's a big topic, is how is diet actually changing the microbiome? And there are pr proposed foods, such as diets that are high in simple sugars. Uh, the idea that sugar is a food that's very attractive to bacteria in our gut, and they create hydrogen, and they create metabolites, maybe lacking short-chain fatty acids, which has actually been proposed as a protective barrier in the gut. Um, so foods that are low or that ignite a change in the short-chain fatty acid production may impact, again, the permeability of the gut and the bacteria will thus invade. So there are factors that we believe are involved, but again, without a gene, I'm not sure it's, a rele it's that relevant and we're not sure what it's exactly doing to the microbiome to be considered environmental factor. Smoking would be another possible risk factor, especially for Crohn's but in ulcerative colitis, it's protective. So they even looked at using nicotine patches, et cetera, to, uh, and the role for ulcerative colitis. Um, not that we're proposing everyone should smoke, but the idea that in patients with uncontrolled disease, um, the idea that maybe um, nicotine was actually protective, which is interesting. So when people were told later on in life for cardiac reasons or other reasons to stop smoking, it's an obvious reason, but there was a second peak in ulcerative colitis when people stopped smoking, um, which is interesting. But in Crohn's, it actually causes more severe disease, increased rate of surgery, and increased risk of disease.